Heavenly Father, we are here today to celebrate you because you, King Jesus, are on your throne still today. And we're here to praise you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Cross Church. Welcome. Before you grab a seat, go ahead and be friendly. Say hi to those around you for a minute or so. Good job, everyone. You all pass. Everybody looked friendly. Go ahead and grab a seat. You can still keep saying hi if you want. And if you're in the back of the room, go ahead and feel free to come on forward. There's lots of seats down here in front and a lot of space to pass on by. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Making me feel welcome here at the Cross. Welcome on this Sunday morning here at the Cross Church, Hallandale Beach, Florida. It is great to see all of you, but I want to especially give a warm welcome to those of you here for the very first time. I met at least 20 people, honestly, that have come in for the very first time this morning. Don't quiz me on your names right now, uh, but Pastor Greg has a photographic mind, so he will remember each and every one of your names without ever meeting you. Uh, but anyway, we want to welcome you. Thanks for being here with us, and we look forward to connecting with you later on. If you're new to the cross, hopefully you found out some information about us, but the best way to find out what is going on here at the cross, what we believe, and the history of the cross, and anything else you're looking for is on the Cross Church website. And if you're in this space and you have a mobile smartphone, go ahead and take it out. If you've never been, on the back of the chairs in front of you, scattered around are these cards on the backs of the chairs. And you can just take out your camera app and let it hover over the barcode that's there, the QR code, and it will pop up to the Cross Church website. It's also great, by the way, if you have to get your oil change or you're sitting in traffic, not in traffic, I didn't mean that, if you're sitting on the bus uh, or at lunch, to bring up your smartphone and then discover more about what's going on at the Cross Church. But pet peeve, I reminded you guys of my, one of my pet peeves of last week. Everybody here has pet peeves. It's not a bad thing. Who has pet peeves? No, for real, we're in church. Be honest. God's watching. Who has pet peeves? We all have pet peeves. One of my pet peeves, there is a lot of great stuff that happens each and every week here at the Cross Church. And every week, it never fails. I always hear about, oh, I didn't know that that was happening. Oh, I didn't know that that was going on. So the best place to find out information there is on the Cross website, and you can sign up for text updates and email updates so that no pet peeving going on. Okay, any longer. A couple of announcements, though, for stuff that's going on. This week, this week, we're back to our typical fall schedule for Bible studies and meetings. So Tuesday nights, women, it's your chance for our small group Bible study. Tuesday nights at 6.30. Here, if you can only make it at 7 because of work or kids or whatever it is, pop in. Tuesday nights, women, it's your time. Wednesday nights is our all-church fellowship time. 7 o'clock Wednesday nights. Same rules apply. Pop in whenever you can. And then Thursday nights. Guys, we just started this back up. Guys, come through. Going through a great book. Um, I don't know what the women are doing. Sorry, but we're doing this book uh, along with Scripture, Man in the Mirror, which is a tremendous book. And wives, if you have an opportunity to remind your husbands and say, don't worry. Don't, don't, you go. They will come back different for sure. All right? For sure. All right? So don't miss out this week on things that are going on. There's another few things. I, I hope you felt the burr, the cold today. Some of us had scarves on. I know Charlotte, I don't know wherever she's at, but she had a scarf. Um, she's from Puerto Rico, so she gets, you know, extra points for living in this frigid land of Miami. Um, but we are getting closer to Thanksgiving soon, and then also Christmas. And so a couple of announcements. In the front here, if you notice some of these boxes, we are a part of what Samaritan's Purse does each and every year, Operation Christmas Child. And one of the things about a month ago now, we had uh, one of our own, that's someone that comes here, has been a part of our church for a long time. She, growing up in Kazakhstan, I believe it was, got a box. And her 
her parents got boxes, her brothers and sisters, and we were able to hear her testimony of what one of these meant to her life, right? So this is a tangible way for you to be involved, and if you don't know about it, here's what it is. You get a box. We are out of these boxes, okay, because people still have them, and we'll bring them back next week, next Sunday. You have to bring them back uh, because they get shipped in and then shipped all over the world, but shoe boxes count. Somebody this morning just said that Uh, what store was it? Hobby Lobby even has these still available. They are a Christian-owned company, so they support this. But any shoebox will work, and you can find a listing, and these will go to children all over the world. And in that moment, like Saya from our church body mentioned, she was able to discover her sisters and her and her family were able to say, wow, people over in the United States of America care about us. That's crazy. For Christmas, we have gifts, We've never had that before. And on top of it then, the notes inside said, Jesus loves you. And there's also an introduction to what Jesus did for them and how much he loves them. So practically speaking, this is a great way for you to get involved in outreach all over the world. Obviously, we do outreach here locally, but this is a great way. So get involved. If you have questions, grab me or anybody else with a tag, and we'll get you set up at Operation Christmas Child one more week. And we'd like to have boxes all across the front of the stage. We almost do because they're coming back, but we'd love to have that and say, look at what you, the people of the Cross Church, have done. The last thing is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is coming up. Everybody remembers that. I was talking with uh, Dan, I think, is, uh, and then, anyway, I talked to a number of people this morning, but transplants from other, pe- from other places around the world and also from other places here. There are many, many people, as you look around the room, that are transplants who don't have family Here, this is a great place if you talk to people, if you connect with people after service, you connect with people at Bible study to say, hey, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Because it is a great day to celebrate Thanksgiving, to give thanks to God for what he has given us mutually together, even if it's family away from your family, right? So I want to challenge all of you here, if you have the means or you have the capability, or even if you don't know anyone yet, reach out because it can turn into something special for what God wants to do in connecting you with people here at the Cross Church for Thanksgiving, all right? (sighs) Somebody told me recently, um, I'm not looking at them, but they told me that I talk too fast, but sometimes there's a lot to go through. I think that's it in the way of announcements that we're going through. We're going to go now into a time of prayer, and so if you wouldn't mind standing with me now, if you haven't been to the Cross Church before, we do take time to pray. And I mentioned it before on the Cross Church website, but also there's hard copies in the back each and every week. You, people, the the body here, this fellowship, submits prayer requests, and they get prayed for each and every week. So I want to challenge you, if you haven't done that, and there's something going on in your life, or if there's a, a miracle that happened that you have praise for, let the rest of the body know. All right? And we'll go through some of those today. But as a reminder, we're going before the God of the universe. We just sang about him. He is king. He is on his throne. And he cares about the details of your life. No matter where you're at as you walk in this space this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm in awe of what you're doing in this place. A year ago, we weren't here. We just began gathering here in this space in February. You have provided this house, and we have so many praise reports, so many things that you have done of lives changed, of people getting baptized to say, I, to the rest of the world, I am now a follower of Jesus. I heard a testimony of someone this morning in older age. They're serving now as part of the cross church body, formerly an atheist, Lord, because you are able to transform hearts and minds. You sent your son to die here on this earth. Jesus walked a perfect life, lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross. Why? So that we could be in unison with you, God, again, and also forever in eternity. Father, we praise you for that reality. And I pray if there's anybody here today, even as believers, if we're not cognizant of it, if we're ungrateful, if we're not in a real space to say, thank you, Lord, that you would convict and you would challenge, you would change our hearts. And if there are people that are walking in here for the first time, maybe they feel far away from you. You're not far away. You say, draw near to me. I'm right there. I'm going to draw near to you, Lord. 
Help them to know it today. Help them to hear your Holy Spirit working in their hearts and their minds. We pray that lives would continue to be changed and transformed in this church, the Cross Church, Hallandale Beach, Florida. We thank you and praise you. Father, we also know that in this world, you will have trouble. It's what scripture said. We will have trouble. Just because we're followers of you, we're not immune to the things of this world. And Father, you care about what we're going through. And Jesus, you were here. You know what it's like on earth. Father, we know that you're listening today, that you're here with us gathering in this house today, and we know that you do care. Father, we have team members and family from this church that aren't back with us because of disease, because of cancer, because of illnesses, Lord, that the doctors don't know what it is. Father, you are the great physician. You are able to heal. We ask that you would in each of these instances, Lord, because you are still able to do miracles. You're the same yesterday and forever. You don't change. We're declaring that, reminding ourselves of that today again, Lord. Father, we also know that this is a hurting time of the year as we go through Thanksgiving and then through Christmas. And also, Father, with the craziness going on in the rest of the planet. We know that resources have been depleted. Families have been divided, Lord. Finances have been strained. Jobs have been lost. Father, we pray that you would work. Those of us that are believers here in this house, I pray that they would look up to you, not down at their circumstances and say, Lord, help me now. And declare that we, are, we know that you are able to provide and stretch finances and to provide job opportunities, Lord. We pray that you would work and that the rest of us would hear about the work that you're able to do and are doing now. Father, we know that there's families that have been torn apart, ripped apart. You created family. You care about family. Father, for those that are going through difficult times with a husband, with a wife, with their children, whatever it is, Lord, help them to know that nothing is too hard for you. You're never too far. You can do the impossible. There's people in this audience where you have done the impossible in their lives of husbands and wives before. Father, we pray that you would do it again. And Father, for the youth and the children that are here, I pray that they, through the example of their parents, through the example of the rest of the body here, even in this house today, as the children look up and see their parents and the rest of the adults here singing praise, that they would understand, huh, there's something here. Father, we pray that you would continue to do incredible work. Wherever they are, as you walk in today, Lord, as we sing this song, you are able to break through whatever it is. We're in anticipation of what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen.
you guys. Uh, welcome to the Cross Church. We're glad you guys are here today. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and kick them open to the Gospel of John as we're going to begin in the Gospel of John today, verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Gospel. If you need a Bible, we've got some guys handing out Bibles. Just lift up your hand. We'll get one to you. Be Make sure that we uh, get a Bible in your hand. And if you have it maybe on your 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 app on your phone, uh, certainly that's one way to do it too. Um, there's a couple over there, Frank, there you go. Uh, hey, one thing for sure, um, I just want to thank all of you who maybe are first-time guests that decided to come to the cross today. We want to welcome you again and appreciate you guys being here. I know I, I met uh, a few people and it's always great to see people find us somehow, some way. And the Lord leads you here. And so uh, uh, what we like to do is we uh, dig into the word and we're going to be in this gospel of John. Uh, let's stand together and uh, we're going to read together. We're not doing a lot of verses today. So you're probably like, well, how long are we going to be in the gospel of John for? Well, I'm not sure, actually. We'll, we'll let the Lord decide that. Um, but but uh, we're just glad you're here. And so you guys are going to read the even verses. There's only going to be two verses you have to read out loud today. I'll read the odd verses, and then uh, we'll pray. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. 
And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the gospel of John. Lord, we thank you that we can dig into this living and powerful word. And Lord, this is all about you, Jesus. This is all about bringing glory to you and honoring you as fully God, fully man. And uh, we get this opportunity to discover you better here today and each week. And so I pray that your spirit would lead and guide this time, that every distraction and all the things, uh, technical problems, various things, Lord, would get out of the way and we would be able to concentrate on your word now because your word is really truly what matters. And that is what is going to lead us into a deeper relationship with you. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray you would just empower me to be able to teach Lord, by the power of your spirit, that your word would come alive to every heart that's here. We'd walk out of here changed and uh, just cl cl closer to you. And so we pray um, for your blessing on this time. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. Hey, uh, this is such a blessing, you know, for us to be able to gather in this place. Uh, as you know, we're we're, we've, we've been in here, for those of you who haven't been here, we've been in here since February. God allowed us to be in here since February, and what a blessing that is, right? We got to <laughs> praise God for that. And uh, we're not sure what the next steps are. Like, we're, we're waiting to see where God's going to take us. We're going to be in 2022. So uh, our goal is uh, God can do a lot in 2022. You know, what could the Lord do in 2022 with the Cross Church, you know? And so we're praying for those things. So keep praying praying for us, for wisdom, for guidance, for all the details that God has for us. But I know God's going to do something great and he's going to provide. He's already put pieces in place and uh, I just can't deny what the Lord is doing. And so we want to, I want to encourage you, church, that your prayers, God is hearing your prayers and uh, he is aligning us to be exactly where we need to be. Amen. So we're going to walk in faith and not, uh, not by sight, right? And uh, that's why we get into God's Word, because we're able to discover a little bit more about who Jesus is and what He's all about. You know, and I know that maybe some of you were brought here um, today, maybe you're trying to search, maybe you're searching Jesus, you're finding Him. You know, I know Google searches for Jesus, even in this area, uh, that it's, there's a lot of Google searches for Jesus. It always spikes during, thank, excuse me, during Easter and Christmas. Easter and Christmas is the, it goes double. Google searches go double Easter and Christmas. And we are, if you did not know, we're about to hit Thanksgiving, which means we're all downhill to Christmas, right? And so it's like, oh yeah, that's right. Christmas is here. That's why we got boxes and you saw signs out for our Christmas Eve services. We're excited about those. But you're searching maybe for different reasons. It may have been a Google search or maybe it's because, hey, I lost a job and I'm trying to figure out who God is, or I've, I've messed up in relationships and I want to I wanna figure out where I'm at. Or you just, you had a health scare. I've, I had that when I was, you know, a backslidden, if you would, Christian, or not really even walking with the Lord at a time, and that health scare comes in your life, you think you're going to die, and then God uses that to bring you to a place where you're humbled in a way where you go, I need to figure out who Jesus is because I may be meeting him really soon. And that could happen. Or it could be that you are at a place where it's a financial hit that's happened to you and you're trying to figure out, well, where are you, Lord? What, what is going on in my life? And are you real? So no matter where you're at or how you got here, I'm glad you're here. Because people, un unfortunately, they search in the wrong places for Jesus. They search in the wrong places. You know, I, I saw this article about how many foods have been tried to sell on eBay that have the image of Jesus on them. Have you ever heard, seen this? This is classic. I'm going to show you a couple of them because, you know, I figured you'd be really interesting. Um, that one is a fish stick. A fish stick. That guy kept it in his freezer for a long time before he actually sold it on eBay. I'm not kidding. Some of you are going, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. And, I, and this is a piece of non bread. Any non lovers out there, you would never eat that because it looks a lot like Jesus. There's a banana. There's Jesus on the banana. Now, they literally would start, try to market these on, on uh, eBay. And then, of course, the pièce de résistance. This is a uh, 
pierogi. It's a Polish dumpling. Anybody pierogi fans in here? Okay. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? Pierogi? Thank you very much. So that's a pierogi. She's happy because she sold that for $1,700, more than $1,700. Now, I don't know if somebody ate it and it tasted better or if they just framed it and kept it in their house or whatever, put a little oxygen tank on it, but um, that's not the real Jesus. And it's funny how people will be desperate to find something that maybe I can have a tangible spiritual connection. And the question is, well, why would, why would that be the real thing? Why would an image on, a, on anything about anyone be for real? When you hold in your hands a book that is full of the discovery of the real Jesus. And this, this Gospel of John, you guys, it is a important treasure of truth about who Jesus is. It is an incredible, yeah, you can praise God for this book for sure if you want. It is, you guys, it is one of those books that, uh, I, it, you know, let me say the gospel, what does that mean, the gospel? Well, the gospel means the good news, right? And so I know that some of you may be familiar and you may say, well, I know there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And you got John. What, what's the difference? Interesting that you should ask. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are actually what we call the synoptic gospels, okay? That means that they see together in common. So you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They kind of tell similar stories. It's about the, the king, Jesus walking the earth, earthly stories about him, parables, uh, baptism, transfiguration, all these things, right? John goes at it from a totally different perspective, not to contradict them, but to, in fact, truly confirm what they were saying, but also giving us a picture of who Jesus is from the heavenly perspective. It's like, here he is. This is Jesus, truly God, truly man. But I'm going to give you the, the truth about who he is and, and from the divine aspect of who Jesus really is. You see, we're going to discover in this gospel of John, Jesus. John, who wrote it, we just got done with 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We love that. That was great. And uh, some of you are loving the fact that 2 John and 3 John were a lot shorter. And so that worked out better. But, uh, but here's the idea. John was, this was written around 95 AD. He's older in his life. And he was the only living apostle, okay? Everybody else died. He died. He was the only one that lived a natural in, in life and, and was had a natural death. Everybody else was martyred for their faith. Matthew, Mark, go down the list. They were all martyred for their faith. What does that mean? That means they died for their faith in Jesus Christ. So if somebody ever tells you well, this Jesus thing is all made up and there's not, not any truth in that. This, this whole gospel thing, I mean, they, you know, everybody's got their, their reasoning because they've been to searching for the wrong Jesus, to be honest with you. Uh, you have to understand that why would these guys die for a lie? I mean, not even when Watergate happened, did those guys, were they willing to die for a lie? I mean, they turned on each other faster than you could really call it. And that's why many became, went to prison and there were literally only 12 of those guys. But here's 12 disciples who say, hey, uh, we, we saw Jesus. We hung out with him. We saw him crucified, uh, other than obviously James who was already martyred. And, and we believe and we put our faith and trust in him. And then they went and what did the Bible say in the book of Acts? They turned, they were accused of turning the world upside down. Why? Because they went and they, with power, with, with in, incredible, the power of the Holy Spirit, they went and they taught people that Jesus, he died on a cross, he was buried, but he rose again. And he is the one who comes to take your sins upon him so that you could be forgiven of your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If you've come searching for Jesus, you've come to the right place. 
Because what we're going to talk about is who this Jesus is and why, in fact, you should embrace him. Why, in fact, you should know him. And as Christians, many of you are already Christians out here, this will only confirm or reaffirm some of the facts that you know about Jesus. But it should be this exclamation point in your walk with him to say, hey, you know what? This is why I believe what I believe. This is why I stand where I am. The gospel is not a fairy tale. It's the truth. It's Jesus was born in a manger. He did live a life. He was crucified on a cross. All of these are historical facts. We know the tomb is empty. You go to Jerusalem, you're not going to find his tomb. I've been there. Couldn't find it. But you have this opportunity where you go, okay, wait a second. This is, this is I'm trying to search I'm trying to discover who Jesus is. Well, it's not going to come in a stamp on a food, but it's going to be the authenticity stamp on the Word of God. And today we dig into the beginning part of this book, which is an incredibly powerful book. It's a divine word about the divine word himself that actually really truly, I believe, can change not only your Christian walk, because I think it should challenge all of us, but if you're not a Christian yet here, if you're searching for Christ, man, it's going to challenge you to believe or know or understand. So what, why did John write this, in fact? Well, I want to show you this verse. It's in John chapter 20, and it says this in verse 30. Uh, so go over to me. Just keep your place in John 1 where we were and flip over to John chapter 20. And this is towards the end because there's 21 chapters. So John chapter 20, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 30. In John's writing, he says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's why John wrote this book. That you and me would see these things and believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Christ? I thought that was his last name, Christ, Jesus Christ. No, it's not his last name, it's his title. Jesus, the Christ, it means he's the Messiah. He's the one that was sent, anointed by God to come to this world to save sinners. But yet he was fully God and fully man. We're going to get into that in a second. But here's the idea that he says that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing... You may have life, that word zoe in the Greek, zoe, zoe, if your name's zoe, you're, you're abundant, you're vitality, you have life to the full. It's, an, it's that not just, oh, it produces a bio, you know, biological life, but it's actually, man, it's a life. It's the, the true life that we can live in this world. You remember uh, Jesus said in John chapter 10, Remember what he said, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life to the full, or life abundantly, right? Yes. It's overflowing life. And the question is, do you have life? Jesus said to Martha when um, her brother Lazarus was, basically he had died, and he said, Martha, Martha, I, I am the resurrection and the life. If a man believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. I mean, radical statements Jesus made. And what we have to do is unpack all those and, and get those as we go through this Gospel of John and we realize, well, John had a purpose. And his purpose was to, for you and me to understand that this Jesus, who he's talking about, you want to discover who he is? Well, he, in fact, was everything that everyone wrote about in the Old Testament prophecies, in those messianic prophecies, and now he's fulfilling all those things, but he was fully God and fully man at the same time. Now, go back with me to John chapter 1, and we now kind of kick into um, this area of Scripture as we look at, you know, this Verse in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I know some of you are going, if you're new to the Bible, you're kind of going, what, why, why would, if, if, what's the deal with the Word? Like, who is the Word? In the beginning was the Word. Is that a secret Word? Is there some secret Word that God's not telling? No. In the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why would John do that? Well, if you look down to John uh, 1.14, check it out just down below there. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So you're saying the Word became flesh and dwelt among us so we can behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus said, oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life in John 3, 16, right? So the word is Jesus. So we, but you may say, well, why didn't he just say that, right? How many of you are going, hey, well, why doesn't he just say, that, you know, in the beginning was Jesus, and, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great to, like, make it more simple? But think about it for a second. We're not living in those days. But in those days, the Greeks, the philosophers, were, they had this uh, idea that there was some force, some nature, something out there that was kind of the, the, the thoughts of how all of this came into existence, how everything was sort of put into being, and how, in fact, this universe was sort of held together and brought together. And so for them, they called that the Greek word logos, or L-O-G-O-S. And so you, you have that word, and, it, the, and for them, that's what they identified with. And at the same time, the Hebrews identified the word of God, when, when this is the word of the Lord, this is the word of God. Whenever they would hear that, they would believe that that is from God himself. And so that logos was the same for one or the other. And so what John is doing is he basically saying, hey, I know you guys are trying to figure out who that word is. You've been discussing it and debating it and having philosophical discussions about who this is, this, this sort of force or nature that you feel is impersonal. I'm going to tell you he's very personal and that his name is Jesus. That's what, in fact, as he brings it to, hey, here you go, Greek, here you go, Hebrew. I'm going to bring you together so you understand that this, the Savior, is in fact the Word. Words are very important, right? We, want, we use words to communicate. We use words to, hey, this is my, this is my uh, thoughts. These are my wants. These are my actions. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. The other night, um, Gabby and I had put Layla down to sleep. We had uh, prayed with her, and, and uh, then, we, then we sit in, in the bed, and I kind of, it was Monday night, and Pittsburgh Steelers were playing, so I had the game on my laptop with like a covering over it so the light wouldn't shine, and Gabby was kind of off to the side, and so we're, we're quiet. We have our headphones in, you know, you're kind of really quiet, and then all of a sudden, in the stillness and the darkness of the silence, because Layla has been, we've been teaching her, hey, use your words, to express as opposed to <laughs> so we're like use your words words and so we're teaching her how to put the words together right whatever we can do to get the words together I know some of your parents are like yeah whatever buddy we've done that for years and so so here's the idea so we're, we're sitting there we're all of a sudden she, her words that she likes to start to put together is I want which is interesting. <laughs> so, but she, it's good because she's expressing, right? Hey, this is what I want. So all of a sudden in the stillness and the darkness, and I, we're sitting there. I want come up. <laughs> which meant like come out. Come out and basically hang with you guys. And in the middle of the night, I want come up. <laughs> I want Come on. <laughs> she repeated it twice. So now it's like, what are you going to do? You can't. I had to, you know, let's, okay, bring her on up. Let's go ahead and hang out. And there you go. The words are clear. Can I tell you that God's word is super clear? And he wants his expression of who he is, is all about who Jesus is. Do you guys understand that when Jesus came into this world, he is the exact representation of who God is? And yet, what we're going to discover right now is this first thought is that Jesus, in fact, is the Word and is God. Because look at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word. We'll get back to in the beginning in a second. Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now, if you've had a Jehovah Witness background or perhaps you've had somebody knock on your door, they may show you their New World Translation where the Greek, the only two Greek people that have ever translated the, the, uh, the, the word the there to uh, a. And so what they say is, and the word was a God. Because they believe that, in fact, Jesus was not really, truly um, one with the Father. And so they have to decimate. This is what cults do, heresies do. They will take away from who, in fact, the deity of Christ is. And so what you have to understand is why John is writing this is because even in those days, the Gnosticism was rampant. And remember, that's why he even wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, because people were coming with all sorts of false teachings about Christ. They were saying, hey, no, he's just an emanation. No, he's not. He's a spirit being. Either, either you know, his body, if, if everything was uh, bad about material, then he couldn't have been really a real being inside the body because then God would have been part of that. So they came up with all these esoteric ways of supernatural knowledge, higher learning, whatever you want to call it, that they felt like, that's great that you know Jesus, but we got a, a little bit higher way of knowing him. And that's what happens with cults today. Well, no, no, you, you don't grasp the whole thing. I got something else. And where did you get that from? Is it in the Bible? Because I, I didn't see it in the Bible. Well, we have this other book, or I've got this other option that this is what they teach us at this uh, tower, or whatever it might be. And this is why when you're discovering Jesus, you've got to stick to his truth, and you've got to understand his truth is what you, you stand upon. That when... When the Word says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and there is no other Greek term for that. When you look at every Greek scholar, nobody interprets it as a God, but in fact was God. Yeah. Now, how does that? I, I, don't, I don't get it. He was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the Word was not only with God, but was God. So now we're getting into what we call that Trinitarian doctrine. I know some of you are going, wow, this is a deep Bible study. How long is this going on for? But I want you to understand that this is why we stand upon what we believe and what it's all about, right? Because if we know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right, and, and we know these truths about that, then we know that, hey, here's our Savior not only is the word but he is god and so if he's god then there is in fact what if he was with god and he was god then wait what what happened How? well that's where you have the father the son and the holy spirit you see we have we don't believe in three different gods let me make this clear we believe in one god three different persons of the same godhead you guys follow now, I know that that, listen, for all of us, we kind of go, I don't really get all of it. How does that work? And you can try to break that down and say, I don't get how it works. And you can try to give simple illustrations to make people understand. But even those do not, you know, like for instance, water, ice, and steam, you know, you got like three different particles of the same H2O, but yet it's different ways of kind of doing it. But yet, and, and there's many threes in everything we do interestingly enough height width and depth i wonder i wonder if god just meant to put everything in threes so you'd be reminded that in fact he is one god but in three persons because yes it's a lofty thing to think about and to you know this is the simple answer that i've gotten from various people especially jehovah witnesses like oh yeah yeah how can you believe that there's like you know, three different persons of the same God. That's not impossible. That's impossible. How, how can that ever happen? I've had people really question. And I go, well, here's what the Bible says. And then as you begin to share scripture where there's Trinitarian proof within that scripture, and here, here's, a, here's a verse in Acts where, in fact, they call the Holy Spirit God. And here, here's a verse where, in fact, Jesus is called God, where he says, my Lord, my God. Thomas worshipped him. And he didn't, Jesus didn't say, stop it, Thomas. I can't take any worship from you because I'm not God. No, no, no. So it's very important for you to understand that this truth, the word Trinity may not be in the Bible, but in fact, the truth of the Trinity is throughout Scripture. In fact, when we look at in the beginning, 
This, this word, in the beginning, if you go back, in the beginning was the word. Where do you recognize that from? Oh, in the beginning. That would be in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning, God created. But, but what John is saying is that in the beginning was the word. So in other words, Jesus was already before the, the creation. And do you, do you get that? And not only that, but he says... He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So he gives, wow, this is, I mean, you're talking, he was already there before creation? I thought he got born in a manger in Bethlehem, right? No, no, no. No, Jesus was already there before creation because Jesus is God. Wait, but I thought the Father's God. He is. I thought the Holy Spirit's God. He is. But wait, I don't understand. How does that work? I'm not sure if I get it all either. <laughs> but here's what I know. I know that you and I, we look on and we see that truth be brought forth in the Word of God so that when we see Scripture that just challenges us or encourages us, what we can say is, okay, wait. So in the beginning, if you go to the first page of your Bible, right? Genesis 1. And here, here's what, uh, in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And it's interesting, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was um, over the face of the waters. So there's already in this picture, in the beginning, God and the ver- and the tense, or excuse me, the verb there is Elohim, the, the Hebrew word, excuse me, is Elohim, which is a plural form of God. And so it's saying, okay, so this plurality of God created the heavens of the earth, but it's not multiple gods. It's just the earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Wait, so the spirit's there. God is there. Jesus is there. You're saying Jesus was there? Yes. So then when did Jesus, when did he come, when did God get discovered or born? I don't know. Here's what I know. He was is before all things, and he was and is. And in fact, he never was born or discovered. He just is. That's why he is the I am. It's just I am. So I know for all of us, it's kind of like, wait, I don't get that. Because our human brain, the Bible would say that his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Like, he's just smarter than us, and he gets things. And he's, remember, he's outside of time. There's no time constraints on God. And so we get to that place where we realize, wow, in the beginning was this, the, the Word, and the Word was with God. And that, that would be the second thought, if you're taking note, is this, that Jesus coexisted with the Father before the beginning. So he was already there before that creation even happened. Do you guys follow me? So that it, it, it's not a he was born in Bethlehem, that's when he started his life. No, man. That's why you have all these Christophanies, which are appearances of Christ throughout the Old Testament. We've mentioned it before. Who was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who was in the fire with those guys? That fourth man that looked like the Son of God? Well, that was Jesus himself. Who, who appeared to Abraham? Uh, and, and basically, at the, Melchizedek, we believe that was Jesus himself. So you go through, there's so many scriptures in the Old Testament where we believe Jesus shows up. We just talked about it, in fact, in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, this last Wednesday, and how, in fact, that angel of the Lord was Jesus himself, and Daniel fell prostrate down because he was in the presence of God. And why did he fall prostrate? Because, man, this was like something he had never experienced before, and this was a man of God like nobody prayed three times a day, spent time, you know, encouraging, challenging, doing the right thing, and yet in the presence of God was humble. See, there's a power in the presence of God. And when you come into a house like this, the reason we worship the Lord Jesus is not because he was a man like us, but he was fully man but fully God. That's the difference. You see, if he was just man, then he would be imperfect how would how would he how would his sin how would his excuse me how would his blood pay for our sins he was sinless 
How can you be sinless as just a human? You can't. Because we all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin and make mistakes. But God doesn't. So wait. So when Jesus was born as a baby, you're saying he was God in the flesh? Yes. That's what the Bible is teaching. That's what you go back to John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. He coexisted. He was there. That Elohim was there. Uh, and, and again, he always was and he always is. He was from the beginning. And I know for us, man, it's like, well, I don't really, I don't really get all that. I mean, how does that work? And, and, you know, this Trinity of God, well, I want you to look to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Go over to, with me to Philippians, just past Corinthians. You'll hit Ephesians, and you go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to pick it up in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And this is what Paul writes. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now this is Paul now writing saying, okay, I I want you to realize this, that him who was in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So what happened? We see this Jesus was equal with God. He's in the heavenlies. And then he's sent to earth to live as you and me. Because you and I would then have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. So that when you go to the throne room of grace, when you pray, you're able to go boldly to be able to access and realize, you get me, Jesus. You get what I've been through. You've been through temptations. You haven't succumbed to them because you're sinless. But you know exactly. Anytime you're praying and you feel like, well, I don't know if God gets me, all you got to remember is that, oh no, God gets me because Jesus gets me because he was truly, fully man, fully God. He went through all those hurts and pains. Do you remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happened? Do you remember what happened as he was about to go to the crucifixion in that garden? And as he began to anxiously pray before the Lord, what happened is his capillaries actually broke open from the stress and the blood mixed with the sweat. And he began to drop drops of blood, the gospel tells us. Why? Because here's Jesus saying, Lord, if there's any way that this cup, what cup? The cup that was going to pay for the price of man's sins could pass from me, then, then not, then please, Lord, but not my will, but your will be done. Wait, but if he's God, can he make that decision? But he submitted to the Father's will in that. So even in that perfection of being equal with God and with God, in the midst of it all, he gives you and I an example of submission to the Father. And that is important for us as Christians because, man, it can be hard to submit your will to God's will, right? Because we look on and we go, well, Lord, I think I got it figured out. I think we should do it this way. And have you ever been there where you're going, Lord, I've got a great idea. I feel like we should maybe, and this is how we pray, right? Lord, here's what I'm thinking. I really feel like this would be the best thing. This is how we should do it. This is how it all should come together. And if you could just, you know, I know you probably already know that because we're like right here, my spirit, your spirit, I get you. And yet God doesn't do that. Why? Because he knows better than you and I do you see for us we try to force our way upon the Lord and the Lord is saying no 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 I got the best way for you Greg don't don't worry don't stress don't try to make it happen don't manipulate trust me are you trusting God in the midst of whatever it may be happening in your life do you look and you say wow you know what I I gotta trust that God is with me that that I'm, even though I'm, I'm broken, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That's a hard prayer to pray, honestly, when you want something really bad, isn't it? Because you want to see God do something. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job. Maybe whatever it is. But man, you're going, Lord, Lord, I don't know. I, I, I feel like this is what it should be, and this is what you should do. And Lord, 
But, but Greg, what about walking by faith and not by sight? I mean, shouldn't I be shouting out the rooftops? But at the same time, I'm submitted to God, trusting that he's going to do his perfect will for my life. We're not a prosperity gospel church. Not everything is going to go great our way. What we are is a word-driven church, and we realize that, man, if I'm praying, and I'm praying saying, well, Lord, I, I, I want your perfect will, it's, it's not bad. But at the same time, I want to pray in faith too. Lord, I believe you're going to do something. I believe and I trust. Like with this church, man, let me tell you, I have told you last week, it's been a battle for me, right? Like, Lord, where are we going to go? What's going to happen? What's the next steps? Lord, where are you going to have us? What, what should I, well, how should I be praying? What should I be praying? It seems like this would be a good spot. It seems like this would be a good fit. It seems like you're doing that work. But Lord, and I have to get to the place where I'm able to say, but Lord, you know best. Amen. Now that's, that's not easy. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. That's not easy because in my heart I feel like, Lord, I kind of know best. <laughs> I feel like I've talked to my team. I've talked to my crew. I feel like, yeah, this would be, this would be a good spot. This be... But you know what? I got to get out of the way and let God do what he wants to do and lead me and guide me. And, and honestly, the that this picture of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it robbery to be e not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he didn't feel like, man, it would be terrible for me to give up this status of majesty and worship and all these things to come to earth to put on human skin so I could live and die for you and me. That's how much God loves you guys. Like when you look at this, this unpacking the gospel of John, you realize in the first five verses, wow, okay, Jesus, you gave it all up for me. That while I'm still sinning, Christ Jesus died for me. That's how much God demonstrates his love for us. That, hey, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to be born. He's going to walk this earth, and then he's going to die in your place because he's perfect. He's sinless. He's blameless. He is God in the flesh who will die for you and for me. That's the only way that your sins could ever be forgiven is through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. And what he did is he died, he, he was buried, but then oh yeah he rose again and he gives you the power over sin and the promise of eternal life amen yeah so you and i hey we got to get to that place where we're going all right lord well wait a second if you pre-existed at all i mean you were you were with the father you are god it's like i hope it takes you to a whole new place in your relationship with jesus that you're not just looking at him as well he's a good guy and you know he he did something for me no 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 we should be in awe in reverence of our savior because of how he laid his life down for us Amen. and what he has given up for us i mean i've told you before I have a hard time giving up a first-class seat to, if I got upgraded to somebody that's sitting in coach. If somebody, if, it's like, would you mind switching seats with this person? They have a, well, uh, do, is, there, is there anybody else that would do that? I'm not saying I fly first class. I'm just saying if that was an opportunity for me, I've already kind of played that out. Would I give that seat up? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, the air quality is not good back there. It's probably more COVID problems back there. First class seems much cleaner up here. It's amazing how selfish we can be. And yet, the Lord is totally unselfish, and in his unselfishness came to this earth to die for the selfish. That's pretty cool. So we look back to John, and we realize, wow, Jesus coexisted with the Father in this Trinitarian doctrine that is there. And the, 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 when, G, you know, when obviously uh, God said, let us make man in, in, after our likeness or in our image and after our likeness, you know, who's he talking to? Who's the us? Well, we really believe it was, in fact, the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, and yet three different persons, but one Godhead okay so we go down and what we pick up now is in verse 3 it says all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made powerful verse all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made so Jesus a third point for you is truly the creator of 
everything. (laughs) You ever thought about that? Well, that's what Paul said in the book of Colossians, in fact. Look at this verse in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16. I'm going to go ahead and throw it up on the screen. But here's what it says in Colossians 1.16. This would be a good one for you to underline in your Bible. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. Who's the him? Who's he talking about? Well, look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Oh, you're talking about Jesus there. Wait a second. So wait. So for by him all things were created? They're in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible? All things were created through him and for him? Yeah, can you imagine? All things, you, everyone, created that this world, the ocean, everything you see, as you look on, you go, wow, all things were created by him. He's got a purpose and a power for your life if you allow Jesus to enter into your life. If you say, Lord Jesus, you're the creator of all things. I should be submitted unto you because you've created me. And what do you want to do with my life? Can I just tell you, you God has purpose for you. He's created you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't listen to the garbage that you came from the goo and then you went to the zoo and then you became you. It's, hey, you actually are created by God that he knitted you together in your mother's womb, that in fact you were born and there is purpose for your life. That he has something greater than what you and I could ever imagine. And if you think about the creation of all things, when I think about the heaven and the moon and the stars, I think about the, the Hubble telescope, right? And those images that they can give you. Because it's incredible, you know, when you think about that we, we live in the Milky Way galaxy, right? Yeah. And there's other galaxies. Galaxies are hundreds of millions of stars, right? And yet we live in that galaxy. And look at all these beautiful galaxy pictures. These are all beyond our own galaxies. Back in the 1920s, in fact, they didn't even think there was more than one Milky Way galaxy. They just thought it was dust or things that were out there. They couldn't tell, right? Until they came up with this Hubble telescope and they realized, wow, there's lots of galaxies. There's hundreds and millions of stars. There's so much out there and beyond. And you think about our own sun, right? The sun, the size of our sun. There's a picture of the sun and you realize, wow, the sun, yeah, it's massive. You know that there, you could fit a million earths into the sun. A million. There's a good picture. There's the big sun. There we are, earth. You see the little arrow down at the bottom? That's how small we are compared to the sun. Crazy, right? But yet, the sun... In comparison to Antares, which is a a very large star, there's there's Antares. And right down, you'll see Sol in the very left-hand bottom corner. That's the sun compared to that. But then Antares is small compared to the pistol star, which is, in fact, uh, the largest out there, 25,000 light years away. And here's what I think. When you look at that, Psalm 147, verse 4 and 5, it's such a beautiful psalm. And I love that. That's just a pistol star right there, right? But Psalm 147, it says this in verse 4 and 5. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. So if Jesus created everything, he counts and numbers all the stars. He calls them all by name. And yet, how much more does he care about you? Oh, you of little faith. How much more does he love you? He'll feed the birds. He'll care for them. And you are of much more value than them. He names the stars, and yet he's given you a name. And what does he want to do in and through your life? What would he do, this 
this creator of the universe. I, I, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm, psalm 8 when David kind of looks up to the heavens, right? And he says this in verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Who are we that this God of the universe would actually love us so much that he would give us not only a relationship with him, you guys, but we would have the opportunity to have forgiveness and one day spend eternity in heaven. And I know right now for some of you, you're going, I don't even know what that's going to be like or feel like. And I encourage you to read the book of Revelation and all the beauty of what heaven's all about because maybe you're not ready for that experience to go into the glory of God. I believe we'll be like Daniel in chapter 10, prostate before God when we sense the Shekinah glory of God. When he is in the house, man, there is nothing bigger than when God's presence is where you are. And when you go to heaven, man, his presence is everywhere. And when you go to heaven, it's going to be like, whoa, this is what? Overwhelming. When you look at the stars, when you look at the moon, when you look at the size and you realize God who created all that, who's larger than all that, cares about your life, my life, the details, whatever it might be, the troubles, the problems, the health scares, the financial difficulties, the the church buildings, whatever it might be. God reminds us, hey, guess what? I'm bigger than it all. Amen? Amen? That I'm bigger than what's going on. That, that this, this is not some, as I mentioned before, a fairy tale, but it is actually a true story of who God is as through his son, Jesus Christ. And we go to, back to John, and we're going to kind of come to a, a little bit of the end here as we have a couple more thoughts. But here he says this, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Don't you love that verse? I love that. In Him was life. Again, that word life is that Greek word zoe, and it's the principle it's not the biological life but the very principle of life it's the man i in him is life and not only that but the light of men and you know when i when it says men it's including everybody gang and jesus he said yeah i'm the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but by me i am the way the truth and the life I have life for you. You know, I may not know everybody's name here, but God does. And he knows what is going on in your life. He knows the details. He knows what's happening in your life. And he wants to bring life and light into us because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Guess what? When you're the light of the world, your friends, the world, they're not going to look on at you and go, oh yeah, that looks great, this Jesus thing. You may talk to them about Jesus, you may share with them, but they may not get it. But that's okay because the darkness doesn't comprehend it, doesn't keep us from stopping, doesn't keep us from going forward. It just means, Lord, help me to be the light and the life that I can bring to men. If I live this kind of life, if I have this kind of way in my life, it's the reality of all that exists is in him. And it's because of him. Everything I have, all the good, all the light in this world really truly is from him. And the darkness, you know, it's a crazy thing about darkness, right? If we turned all the lights off here right now, it would get dark, right? We have no windows. Some of you are going, oh boy, don't do that right now. But somebody would pull out their smartphone, put on their flashlight, and one light would illuminate so much in the midst of the darkness. Because it's incredible what a little light can do in darkness. And what God wants to do with you and me as we follow his son who is not only God and the word and he's the creator and he is this one who is the the light of our life. Man, we have this opportunity, you guys, to be following him 
with all things and realize that, Lord, you can give me not only life, because I, as a sinner, man, I'm dead. Listen, my, the Bible says you're dead in your trespasses, that your sins separate you from a holy God. So I'm dead in those things. But Jesus says, oh, but I have life for you. I can bring you life. I, I can bring the life to you and what's going on in your life. And I, I have everything that you need. And I have the light of the world. And he shines a light on your life. And that's when your life begins to change. When you're, ex- willing, to cha- when you're willing to accept the life of Jesus Christ for your life. Because then he gives you real life. It's not... Hey, it's not the breathing kind. I'm talking about the life that is to the full, the abundant life that Christ has for you and me. So as we look at this kind of area of John, one through five, here's how I can think we can sum it up to apply it to ourselves as we think about those thoughts of, well, hey, he's the word and is God. He coexisted with the Father before the beginning. He's the creator of everything. He is life and light. And here's what happens if you discover the real Jesus. And as we discover him, man, this is going to mean these things. Faith, peace, joy, awe, thankfulness, power. Why? Well, because when you realize that, well, Jesus, he's not just born in a manger and some man or, or, a, or a brother of Lucifer or any of these stupid cultic heretical statements that are out there. But in fact, he's God in the flesh and he died on a cross for my sins and he was the perfect sacrifice. And if I put my faith and trust in him, I'm going to have forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. Then you put your faith in him, not in an institution, not in the cross church. You follow Jesus. And when you follow him, your life will forever change. And then... Hey, you know what will happen? Because of my faith, what will end up happening? Because I know that he's God and I know he pre-existed or co-existed with the Father and not only that, but pre-existed. Man, there's a peace in my life knowing that I serve the God of the universe and, and with that peace comes a lot of joy. I have joy in my heart knowing I'm forgiven. I have a relationship with the God of the universe, the one who created the Antares, the one who created the pistol star, the one who created the sun and yet he created me and you and he's given you and me an opportunity to know him think about that that's that's his he would be the most famous person on instagram if he was here right so if you were if you had jesus if you were a a follower you would follow him and be like oh man how many people are following him well there's millions and millions and every time i see wow there's so many people following this person that's crazy that's awesome great for them but and mine's like really low. But, um, and that's not for you to like, like me or anything. And so, but here's the idea. You, you have Jesus and he shows up and he says, oh, let me open an Instagram account. I'm telling you, it would be probably a division in our world. Well, who would love him? Well, I, I want to love him because he stands for, this is what he did for me and this is how he died for me and this is how he rose again. It wouldn't be everybody. And yet, for those who know him, there's joy. For those who know him, there's forgiveness. For those who know him, there's going to be awe. Because when you discover the real Jesus and you realize that he's the king of the world, that he's the creator of everything, there's awe in his presence. And then there's thankfulness that, man, I'm forgiven that he's taken me from the darkness into the light. You know, the Bible talks about that, man, I was once in darkness and i'll read this verse to you because i think it's really apropos for even my own life as you kind of think about this but he said this in verse 8 of ephesians 5 for you were once darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the lord have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness the unfruitful works of darkness but rather expose them for it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in speak secret but all things that are exposed are manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light so And then he finishes, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It's a powerful verse. It's like, man, 
How many of you, you know, kind of look at that and go, yeah, I was once darkness. That was me. I, if you're a Christian here today, everybody. Because we all were once darkness. And, and you may not have been as bad as me. You've read my testimony. You're like, no, that's, you're, like, you're like really dark, Greg. No, I'm not that, I wasn't that dark. You're way darker than me. But, but here's, what, here's what Paul's saying. Walk as children of light. And when you have the light of the world filling your heart, filling your mind with the things of him, his life, his light, then you can then walk in the light. You no longer, I know, I don't want to be a part of the darkness stuff that I used to do, but it's still really tempting, isn't it? Crazy thing. It still comes after you like a little carrot in front of a horse, like it's dragging, like, hey, did you see this? Today, it's a funny thing. It's really funny. Uh, it, it, I, I just got it before I taught. There was a text that came in. Hey, I met you on Hot or Not. And I'm like, What? hot or not what are you talking about hot or not yeah and I'm coming down to chill for a while and I was wondering if we could you know hang out and hook up and I'm thinking what who writes this first of all who's going on what is hot or not I don't even google it okay I don't want you guys going there I don't know what it is but isn't that funny like before I go out and teach I get a text like hey I met you on hot or not hey I'm in town I'd like to chill out for a while hey wouldn't you like to hang out and do what I, what what why would I want that I don't want that delete how can I block this number I'm trying to figure out how do I block this number from ever calling me again somebody gave him my number I think they probably thought it was a joke oh I got this number from the pastor I'm gonna give it to this guy on hot or not <laughs> Maybe they created a profile or something. I have no idea. But here's what I know. I know if you look at that list one more time and you realize, man, if, I, if, if you and I, we really discover the real Jesus, there's not just faith and peace and joy and awe and thanks, thankfulness, but there's power. Because Jesus gives you the light and he gives you the life. But you just got to walk in that light. And the, the way we walk in it is by the power of his spirit. Amen. We cry out every day, Lord, keep me away from the darkness. Help me to walk the way you want me to walk. Help me to make good decisions. Help me to make good choices. Even on your phones, whatever it might be, whichever way I'm going to go, Lord, help me to live for you and walk in the light. Amen? Amen. God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord, that you are in this book of John, Lord, and Jesus, you get exalted as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we come, Lord, here in this gathering and, and just pray that you would change us. I pray you would change every relationship in this place with you, Jesus, that the people that know you, that love you, that they would only grow more deeper in love with you as we go through this gospel. But that you, Lord, would reveal to us continually who you are and the greatness of who you are, that we would not walk away from that or falter away from that or walk ever in the darkness, but we would always walk in the light. Lord, this world is going to constantly come at us with the temptations and, and things that can provoke us. But Lord, the closer we are to you, Jesus, the more we're going to be walking in the light and the more we're going to be protected with the power of you. So I pray you would help us, strengthen us, guide us, use us. And Lord, more than anything, save those who don't know you yet. That if they came into this place searching, that they know that they know that they know that maybe today is that day where they have found the one who died for them and paid the price for their sins. I pray you would please help them to take those steps of faith, to put all of their trust and all their faith in you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're here today and uh, you are not sure of where you're at, you came in here searching, and you're trying to figure out, like, where am I at with Jesus? We don't want you to leave here without knowing him as your Lord and Savior, and you're wondering, like, well, what's that step? Well, that step is just, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not a not of works it's a gift of God and so if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved the Bible says so it's all about man I, I put my 
confession, my faith, I confess, I agree with you, God, that you let Jesus die for me and he, that he was put on a cross, he was buried and he rose again. I put my faith and trust him because my sins separate me from a holy God. And if that's you today and you want to receive forgiveness, you want to receive the light and life of Jesus, then all it is is, all right, let me, let me pray. Let me ask him. Let me put my trust in him that I would be forgiven today, that my life would be changed today. So I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here. Maybe there's one person here that says, yeah, I want to pray for anybody in here that maybe that's you. God, I pray for anyone right now that maybe they're in that hour decision and they're wondering, Lord, did you die for me? Yes. You're screaming from heaven. I died for you and the rest of this world. And God, I pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, if anyone here wants to begin that life with you today, that their life would be eternally changed today, that they put their faith and trust in you. As our heads are bowed, eyes closed, if you want to receive Jesus, if you're somebody that is never accepted the Lord, or perhaps you're backslidden, you've been like me back in the days, and you've never really truly put your full commitment in Christ. If you want to receive Jesus, you want to receive forgiveness, would you just lift up your hand and look at me, and I want to pray for you today, that today would be the day of salvation for you. Anybody in here that says, yeah, that's me today, I want to receive forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. Don't leave here today without knowing you're forgiven and you have peace with God and the promise of his salvation for you. This is our opportunity, God. We come to you to put our faith and our trust in you. And God, I pray for everybody here that says, yeah, that's, that's me. That's me that... I want to start that relationship with Jesus today. And there may be fear in their heart, Lord. There may be a wonder, like, what could happen to me? But I pray that even as we pray this prayer out loud together, that those that are in this house that want to put their faith and trust in you would even mean it from their heart and believe it, and today would be a day of salvation for them. If you're here, and together as a church, let's pray this out loud, but if you're here and you say, man, that is me today, I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. We're going to pray together out loud. Just say this to the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you rose again. I put my faith and my trust in you. Please forgive me of my sins. And help me to follow you all the days of my life. Change me. Fill me with your light and your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen. If you prayed any, that part of that, and you're like, man, I want to know Jesus. I, that's my beginning. I want you to come down. We want to have a Bible and a Bible study guide. We're not going to force you to do anything else. We just want to give you a Bible and a Bible study guide and make sure that we get a follow-up with you if you need one. And uh, more than anything, that you know how much God loves you and that you follow him each and every day. Let's all stand and let's worship the Lord together. Amen. All right. We'll sing this together. The broken for the broken. Come on. You lay down your life that I might live. A sacrifice so on Jesus. All I have to give, I give. And all I have to give, I give. 
Awesome, Cross Church, that's our prayer for you, for each and every one of us. Before you leave, a couple of announcements, reminders. Tuesday night, women's study. Wednesday night, all church study. Thursday night is the guys. If, if, if you're new to the cross, we would love to say hi and to meet you. If you have prayer requests or any other questions, please come forward, come down in front and talk with us. If we don't see you in the middle of the week, we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.